Um, the eugenics board um, was there as a kind of uh, safeguard organization. It was there to make sure that the recommendations for sterilization that came before it were appropriate. Recommendations were typically made by um, people associated with institutions where uh, people with disabilities were uh, housed and those recommendations often came from the director of the institution, so an institution like the Provincial Training School um, in Red Deer, um, others at uh, Pinocchio and, and uh, uh, just outside of Edmonton as well, um, were also in this position where there would be these sort of internal reviews or a case would go forward and the eugenics board would look at the case file and, make, and meet with the individual. People were recommended for sterilization, sterilization typically between the ages of 13 and 20. And a lot of these were cases where uh, the uh, people were between 13 and, and 15. Uh, there were 4,785 cases that were considered and 99% of them were approved. Um, there, were, there was actually not a single refusal of a case. They didn't turn a case back. Um, they, or they turned them back in the sense they deferred on 60 cases. And when those cases, not all of those cases came back, but the ones that did were, were approved. Um, but it's interesting that only, depending which document you read, 2822 or 2832 sterilizations were, per, were performed. So o over half, but not, not less than 60% of them were actually performed. And I don't know the answer to the question of what happened in those middle cases. That's actually just part of the picture we don't know. And part of what's motivated me is that there's a lot here to know, just about the historical record, which really has to, I think, inform anything that we want to do in light of this. It's not that we can't have views and, and form judgments without it, but it's really one of those areas where if you, if you compare this, if you compare our situation epistemically, if you like, to the situation in many US jurisdictions, you know, they have access to lots and lots and lots of documents and lots and lots of records, and it's a matter, not a simple matter, it may be a long-term matter, for scholars and others to sit down and work through that material. We do not have that kind of uh, privilege uh, right now um, for various reasons that we might talk about in um, discussion. The Sexual Sterilization Act was repealed when there was our last change of government in the province in 1972, when the Progressive Conservatives came uh, to power. Um, pleased to say that uh, my own uh, voting district has recently broken through and uh, made a change here um, in electing Linda Duncan from the NDP, uh, the one out of uh, 28 uh, people elected who, uh, the sole member who wasn't a member of the Progressive Conservative Party. David King was a young, uh, influential cabinet uh, member, and he's actually somebody that we're working with in this network of, of people, and he's spoken out at other conferences that I've organized uh, on, on uh, this. He was the uh, minister who introduced the um, uh, repeal, but he's very clear that Lougheed was the person who was just kind of morally you know, repulsed uh, by the Sexual Sterilization Act, and it was one of the very first things they did it. They did it within about six weeks of, of coming uh, into uh, power in 72. After the repeal, there was the case that's been mentioned of uh, Lilani uh, Muir, who after a long sort of struggle, uh, we heard a bit about yesterday at a conference, Families and Memory, that we had downtown, um, successfully sued the province for wrongful sterilization and confinement. And the judgment from Madam Justice Veit that we uh, heard referred to in Martin's talk uh, con contained quite, I mean, you heard one little snippet, but really quite strong language, an unusual language for a judgment like this uh, from a judge. And many interesting things were um, appended as, as public documents to that decision, which again was somewhat unusual, which in principle makes them much more readily available than other sorts of court documents uh, would be, provided we can prevail on, for example, the university and the province and the courts uh, to have them uh, released. But we actually think there's real hope of that uh, happening. Um, part of what happened after Lilani's case was there were about 800, between 800 and 900 cases that were settled uh, by the province out of court. So there was a kind of class action suit. Field law was involved in um, Lilani's case and also in just over half of these other cases. Um, and we're also working with field law on uh, considering the possibility of getting access to some of that material as well for archival sorts of purposes. You've heard a bit about the McCachran uh, controversy. Doug Walston was very active in psychology and he's actually, he's an emeritus there. He now teaches at um, University of North Carolina. Um, he just moved from Windsor last year and uh, he has been working with Lani on getting a book 
finished, which I am shortly going to read. Um, it is done, and we're going to be looking for a publisher for it um, that tells her story in more detail. And there was this uh, subcommittee that Martin was a, a member of that issued this report that you've heard about. So in the university around 2003 or so, a bunch of us started meeting and talking about this. I'm not exactly sure if there was any one uh, cause, but there were people like Harvey Kran and Jana Greco from sociology. Uh, Jan is one of the few people who's actually uh, looked in uh, detail uh, at these documents, somebody who wasn't directly involved in the legal cases, and she wrote a PhD thesis uh, on the basis of it. Tim Caulfield and Gerald Robertson, uh, Dick, uh, myself, and Glenn, and Leslie Cormack when she was here in history. And we've also linked up with, as I said, field law and sterilization survivors. Uh, we formed a group that we, I chose for its sexy acronym, AIC, uh, the Alberta Consortium on the History of Eugenics in 2005. Uh, if we have a name, we're real. And um, then we developed this what sorts network over, you know, over the last couple of years, as was said, about 80 uh, researchers around uh, this question, what sorts of people should there be? We have a sort of large project, and a few people in this room are involved in it, that operates under that sort of uh, title, what sorts of people should there, should there be, that's interested in a sort of range of different applications. And people can take the question any way they want. And I think it's interesting, what's interesting is to see the links that come up between these sort of independently started sorts of projects once we get talking.